Canada, a people's history. Proudly presented with the corporate partnership support of Sun Life Financial and by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Late at night, somewhere near the Richelieu River in Lower Canada, a secret ceremony is unfolding. These men are plotting an armed rebellion. They call themselves hunters, frères chasseurs. They want to make Canada a North American republic independent of Britain. Of my own free will and in the presence of God Almighty, I do solemnly swear to observe the secret signs and mysteries of the Hunter's Lodge. To help any brother. Joseph Senet is one of the recruits. I was told that the Americans will come with weapons and that they will be assisted by our countrymen that will rise in great numbers and that with this army, we will attack simultaneously in different locations and that the present government will be overthrown and another, formed on the American model, will be established. The hunters swear they will give their lives for the cause of freedom. It is a price many will be called to pay. All this I promise without reservation. If I'm unfaithful to this oath? If I am unfaithful to this oath, I consent to see my property destroyed and to have my own throat cut to the bone. In the 1830s, Canada lives through some of its darkest and most desperate hours. Demands for political freedom lead to armed rebellion. Violent confrontation with one of the world's most powerful armies. Shouts of victory from the great revolutions in France and America still echo around the world. The mightiest empires of Europe and Latin America are shaken to their foundations. In Canada, the currents of revolution exact a terrible cost. Hundreds die on the battlefields, and dozens more are hanged as traitors. But from the ashes of this failed revolution, something new is born. An alliance of Democrats that brings Canada a new political future. In the years after 1820, British North America seems a tranquil, even an idyllic place. It is a land of seemingly inexhaustible natural resources, where men and women make their living in the forests and the fields. Every autumn, armies of lumberjacks invade the brooding timber stands of Canada and New Brunswick. 
And every spring, the raftsmen float tens of thousands of logs out to market. From the Ottawa River to the Miramichi, from the St. Lawrence to the St. John, wood has replaced fur as the economic engine of British North America. Many of these logs are used to build ships, here in Quebec City or in other colonial ports. The Royal William, the first Canadian steamship to cross the Atlantic, was launched here in 1831. But most colonial lumber goes to the building sites of Great Britain. Every year, hundreds of ships bearing cargoes of elm, oak, and pine set sail from Quebec and St. John, New Brunswick. And every year, they return with a very different cargo. Thousands of men, women, and children. The beginning of an unprecedented wave of immigration. One of these immigrants, Catherine Parr Trail, is enchanted by her new home as she sails up the St. Lawrence in 1832. The misty curtain is slowly drawn up as if by invisible hand, and the wild wooden mountains partially revealed with their bold, rocky and sweeping bays. At other times, the vapory volume dividing moves along the valleys in deep ravines like lofty pillars of smoke, or hangs in snowy draperies among the dark forest pines. By the 1830s, 30,000 newcomers a year land at Quebec. The gateway to the Canadas. Some are relatively prosperous, middle-class families fleeing a climate of economic stagnation that has gripped England, Scotland, and Ireland since the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Others are less fortunate, but all seek a better life in the new world. Canada is the land of hope. Here, everything is new, everything going forward, it is scarcely possible for art, sciences, agriculture, manufacturers to retrograde. They must keep advancing. Some immigrants settle in Lower Canada. But most continue on to the Western frontier. Upper Canada is the fastest growing colony in the British Empire. By 1831, there are already 260,000 people here. The new immigrants from the British Isles mix with the descendants of loyalists and American settlers who came in the wake of the American Revolution. Through land purchases and the sheer weight of numbers, the Aboriginal peoples who once had this land to themselves are slowly but surely being pushed aside. Settlers like Catherine Parr Trail soon realize that beyond the cities, much of Upper Canada is still just a step removed from the wilderness. Much as I had seen and heard of the badness of the roads in Canada, I was not prepared for such a one as we travelled along this day. Indeed, it hardly deserved the name of a road. 
Sometimes I laughed because I would not cry. The difficulty of building roads has so far kept most settlements stretched out along the shores of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. But some are now moving north into the backcountry. Pioneer life is hard and men like Robert Davis are becoming angry. I've had in most instances made my own roads and bridges, cleared my own farm, educated myself and my children. I've had my bones broken by the fall of trees, my feet lacerated by the axe, and suffered almost everything except death. I waited year after year in hope of better days, expecting that the government would care less for themselves and more for the people. But every year, I have been disappointed. The neighboring colony of Lower Canada has been settled much longer, for 200 years. Half a million people live here, in well-established towns and farm communities spreading out from the St. Lawrence. The flourishing state of the countryside along the Richelieu River impresses the colony's surveyor general, Joseph Bouchette. Its banks are diversified on each side by many farms and extensive settlements in a very high state of improvement. Some neat, populous and flourishing villages, handsome churches, numerous mills of various kinds, good roads in all directions, with every other characteristic of a country inhabited by an industrious population. The parish of Saint-Denis on the Richelieu now has 3,000 inhabitants. Charles Saint-Germain owns the biggest hat-making business in the colony. Francois Gadbois sells his horse-drawn carriages in Quebec City, Montreal and even in Upper Canada. But not everyone is so prosperous. In the countryside around Saint-Denis, peasants cultivate land that is not their own, a legacy of New France's feudal origins. Year after year, they must turn over a substantial portion of their harvest to the landlord, called the Seigneur. For many hard-pressed families, the burden is too heavy to bear. Louis Duquet has been evicted from his farm on the Seigneury of Beauharnois. He and his young family must seek out a new plot of land and rebuild their lives. Most of the good seigneurial land is now occupied, and the seigneurs are demanding higher rents every year. In desperation, the tenant farmers turn to their representatives in the Legislative Assembly, demanding protection and redress. A great many seigneurs treated these lands as if they had absolute authority over them, selling and transferring them at exorbitant prices by means of illegal contracts, while His Majesty's Canadian subjects have not, until now, been protected against these abuses. On the quiet farms of Lower Canada, the rumblings of discontent are growing louder. Soon, the anger will explode. The 
newspapers of British North America are small-scale operations with a great capacity to provoke and irritate the powerful. This is the age of the partisan press. All through the colonies in Halifax, Quebec, Montreal and York, opposition journalists attack what they consider an arbitrary, self-appointed colonial regime. Whatever goes to extend or to secure the advantages which of right ought to flow to the people, we shall steadily and fearlessly uphold. But these early muckrakers will pay a high price. In York, the capital of Upper Canada, a gang of thugs destroys the presses of the colonial advocate. Its editor, William Lyon Mackenzie, has been heaping scorn on the colony's leaders. The family connection rules Upper Canada. A dozen nobodies and a few placemen, pensioners, and individuals of well-known, narrow, and bigoted principles. The whole of the revenue of Upper Canada are, in reality, at their mercy. They are paymasters, receivers, auditors, king, lords, and commons. Mackenzie denounces this circle of appointees that surrounds the governor as the family compact. He identifies them by name, exposes their family connections, publishes their income. One of his chief targets is the Attorney General, John Beverly Robinson. Another reptile has sprung up in a Mr. William McKenzie, a conceited red-headed fellow with an apron. He said that I am the most subtle advocate of arbitrary power. What vermin. Mackenzie installs new presses and continues his crusade. The step to direct involvement in politics, election to the Legislative Assembly, is a small one. I'd long seen the country in the hands of a few shrewd, crafty, covetous men, under whose management one of the most lovely and desirable sections of America remained a comparative desert. The most obvious improvements were stayed. Dissension was created among classes, and large estates were wrested from their owners in utter contempt of even the forms of the courts. Hey! In Nova Scotia, another rabble-rousing journalist takes aim at his colony's unelected rulers. Oh! Halifax is the gateway to the Atlantic colonies and a military stronghold. Joseph Howe, editor of the Nova Scotian, is the son of a loyalist, but no friend of the local elite. His newspaper accuses them of stealing public money. In a young and poor country, where the sons of rich and favored families alone receive education at the public expense, where the many must toil to support the extortions and exactions of a few, where the hard earnings of the people are lavished on an aristocracy who repay their ill-timed generosity with contempt and insult. It requires no ordinary nerve in men of moderate circumstances and humble pretensions to stand forward and boldly protest against measures which are fast working the ruin of the province. All rise. His Lordship, the Chief Justice, Brenton Halliburton, presiding. The leaders of the colony drag Howe into court on the criminal charge of defamatory libel. I know them as you know them, as the most negligent and imbecile, if not the most reprehensible body that ever mismanaged a people's affairs. They may expect much from the result of this trial, but before I have done with them, I hope to convince them that it is they, and not I, that are the real criminals here. 
When Howe is acquitted by a jury, his popularity is greater than ever, and like Mackenzie, he goes into politics. We are desirous of a change, not such as shall divide us from our brethren across the water, but which will ensure to us what they enjoy. Gentlemen, all we ask is what exists at home in England, a system of responsibility to the people. The governor's men in Quebec City, the power center of Lower Canada, are also coming under attack. Two journalists have dared to criticize the Legislative Council. It is appointed by the governor and blocks almost every law the elected assembly passes. They are sentenced to 40 days in jail for defamatory libel. Daniel Tracy, an Irishman, is editor of The Vindicator. Ludger Duvernay, a French-Canadian, publishes the newspaper La Minerve. As the present Legislative Council is perhaps our greatest nuisance, we ought to seize the means to rid ourselves of it and demand its abolition. Both newspapers speak for the Parti Patriote, a group of Canadian legislators and their supporters. They control the elected, but largely powerless, Legislative Assembly. Their leader's name is Louis-Joseph Papineau. The votes and measures adopted every day by the councillors may only be explained by their impassioned hatred of the Canadian, their insatiable lust for money, and their odious selfishness. Papineau is a lawyer and a seigneur. Early in his career, he was an admirer of the British Constitution. But years of struggle with an appointed governor have made him an advocate of American-style democracy. I do not believe it possible to be happy and fairly treated under the colonial system. How can a governor act justly? Even one who sincerely desires to do so when he is surrounded by such a pack of scoundrels. It is certain that in a time not long from now, all of America must become Republican. We need only to know that we live in America and to know in what condition we have lived there. Louis-Joseph Papineau, William Lyon Mackenzie, Joseph Howe. Three men inspired by the democratic ferment sweeping Europe and the Americas, determined to change a hidebound political system, one way or another. Montreal in 1832 is the economic heart of the two Canadas. 27,000 people live here, half French-speaking and half English. Commerce is controlled by a handful of English-speaking merchants and industrialists, men like John Molson and Peter McGill. That spring, political rivals gather on the Place d'Armes in a bitterly contested by-election. On one side, the English party. It backs the governor and his appointed advisors. On the other, the Patriot, mostly French Canadians and Irish immigrants who share their distrust of British authority. There is no secret ballot. Every voter must declare his or her allegiance publicly. My name is Marie Roy. I am a widow and I'm going to vote for the Patriot candidate. 
Daniel Tracy. My name is Pierre Picard. The poll remains open as long as voters continue to come forward. Leon Charlebois, innkeeper. I vote for the Patriot Party. Leon Fournier, Mason. An election can go on for weeks. This one will last 22 days. Thomas Nolan, I'm a grocer. April 26. It being 10 o'clock in the morning, the poll has not yet been able to open due to the tumult going on outside. May 21st. The Patriot candidate has taken a narrow lead. Emotions are running high. The polls go! Tracy ahead by three votes! Three French Canadians are mortally wounded. Casimir Chauvin, Pierre Billet, and Francois Languedoc. The next day, the Patriot candidate is declared victorious. Louis-Joseph Papineau expresses his outrage to the governor, Lord Aylmer. My heart is filled with sadness. And my letter will find you in the same state as you will already have heard about yesterday's disastrous events that caused bloodshed in our streets. The troops sent to protect His Majesty's subjects fired upon them. Canada has never before been afflicted with such miseries. A few weeks later, more misery for the beleaguered colony. The Carrick, arriving from Ireland, docks in Quebec City with several feverish passengers on board. Three days later, cholera claims its first victim. The disease spreads like wildfire, quickly reaching Montreal. June 14, 1832. Since Monday morning, Montreal is in turmoil, and the alarm is growing every minute. There is no longer doubt that cholera is present. We recommend that the public observe strictly the regulations of the Board of Health. The epidemic is out of control. Hundreds of victims die each day, especially in the cities. The poor districts are ideal breeding grounds for the disease. No sewers. No collection of garbage, contaminated water. There is no use in becoming alarmed. When the illness appears, one must see a doctor at once and should follow his instructions. The apothecary is of all the remedies in stock. Their prices are affordable to all pocketbooks. But in fact, the doctors are overwhelmed and powerless. They believe cholera is transmitted by foul vapors that spread through the atmosphere. Hoping to purify the tainted air, soldiers fire off cannon blasts, and the Board of Health sets barrels of tar on fire. Alexander Hart, a Jewish merchant in Montreal, sees death all around him. None of us go into town anymore. Many are moving into the country. Yesterday, 34 corpses passed our house. Today, 23. Not counting those in the old burial ground and in the Catholic ground. 12 carts are employed by the Board of Health to carry away the dead who are interred without prayers. 
cholera claims 9,000 victims, more than half in Lower Canada. Some people believe England is responsible. Jean-Jacques Lartigue, the Bishop of Montreal, tells a cousin of his growing distress. The other subjects that seem to me most worthy of your attention at the present time are the murder of our Canadian on May 21st, which the governor has since officially condoned, and the invasion of our uncultivated land by British immigrants who threatened to drive us out of our country and reduce our population year after year by the spread of disease. An oppressive atmosphere of death, fear, and political mistrust hangs over the colony. All it will take to ignite it is a single spark. Frustration is at its peak. The Patriot control the assembly, but can exercise no real authority. They draw up a long list of grievances and demands, the 92 resolutions, and send it directly to the government in London. Resolved that this House is nowise disposed to admit the excellence of the present Constitution of Canada. They demand more power for the Assembly and insist that the hated Legislative Council be elected by popular vote. We will not cease our demands for full political rights and powers. And though we feel uneasy, we hope that the British government will at last grant us justice. In this hope, we shall do nothing to hasten our separation from the mother country, unless it be to prepare and lead the people towards that day which will know neither monarchy nor aristocracy. United we stand, divided we fall. The English party is up in arms too. John Molson, one of the most powerful businessmen in Montreal, issues a warning to the Patriot. Recent events have roused us to a sense of impending danger. The French party may yet be taught that the majority upon which they count for success will, in the hour of trial, prove a weak defense against the awakened energies of an insulted and oppressed people. Papineau's wife, Julie, describes an atmosphere of menace in Montreal. I harbor no idle fears but I can appreciate for what they truly are, the rage and the hatred that this party bears towards us. I see that our situation is a lamentable one. They seek to prevail at all costs or trample us. And if we do not have the energy to escape from their power, they will certainly find ways of doing us harm. Disaffection is growing in Upper Canada as well. William Lyon Mackenzie has assembled around him the discontented of the colony. By 1835, he is a member of the assembly and mayor of the new municipality of Toronto. The population of the city has doubled in two years to over 9,000 inhabitants. Like Papineau, Mackenzie draws up a list of demands and sends it to London. The seventh report on grievances categorically condemns the system of colonial government. One great excellence of the English constitution consists in the limits it imposes on the will of a king by requiring responsible men to give effect to it. In Upper Canada, no such responsibility can exist. The Lieutenant Governor and the British Ministry hold in their hands the whole patronage of the province. They hold the sole domination of the country and leave the representative branch of the legislature powerless. 
In Halifax, the same battle is being fought. Joseph Howe is elected to the legislature in 1836. I am approaching now the root of all our evils, that gross and palpable defect in our local government. Compared with the British Parliament, this house has absolutely no power. Howe also draws up a list of demands for political change. But he remains a moderate reformer. His loyalist roots prevent him from going as far as Papineau and Mackenzie. I know that I shall hear the cries of republicanism and danger to the Constitution. But the idea of republicanism, of independence, of severance from the mother country never crosses my mind. I wish to live and die a British subject, but not a Briton only in name. In London, the colonial secretary is inundated with demands for reform. But after three years of deliberation, Britain's leaders reject the 92 resolutions outright. They are convinced that self-government for their North American possessions would destroy the colonial system and gravely weaken the empire. The authorities in Lower Canada prepare for the worst. In 1837, events in Lower Canada take a fateful turn. For the Patriot, the rejection of the 92 resolutions is the final straw. They now carry the debate out of the assembly and move toward open defiance of the government. The first step is to organize massive public demonstrations. The protest movement reaches its climax that fall at the Six Counties Assembly. Five thousand people gather at Saint-Charles in the Richelieu Valley. They have come to hear the colony's greatest orator, Louis-Joseph Papineau. Concitoyens! Confrères d'une affliction commune, vous tous, de quelque origine, langue ou religion que vous soyez, à qui des lois égales et les droits de l'homme sont chers, nous vous sollicitons de prendre, par une organisation systématique, dans vos paroisses et vos townships respectifs, cette attitude qui seule peut vous attirer le respect pour vous-même et le succès de vos demandes. Papineau is emboldened by the groundswell of revolutionary fervor around him. He urges the Patriot to elect their own local officials, in effect to begin setting up an alternate government. Assemblez-vous! Élisez des magistrats pacificateurs, à l'exemple de vos frères réformistes des deux montagnes, pour protéger le peuple contre la vengeance de ses ennemis. Never before has Papineau gone so far. But for the most radical, it is not far enough. Dr. Wilfred Nelson of Saint-Denis, one of the English Canadians to join the Patriot, calls for armed insurrection. Eh bien, moi, je prétends que le temps est arrivé de faire fondre nos plats et nos cuillères en étain pour en faire des balles. Cyril Hector Côté, a doctor from Napierville, is even more blunt. Moi aussi, je prétends que le temps des discours est passé. C'est du plomb qu'il faut envoyer maintenant à nos ennemis. In Montreal, the English party is mobilizing too. Peter McGill, president of the Bank of Montreal, speaks to a crowd of 4,000 people. 
We must admit the constitutional right to meet and discuss and to petition and remonstrate if they feel or fancy themselves aggrieved. But any and all of them who overstep the bounds prescribed by the laws in doing so, who outrage the feelings of loyal and well-disposed peaceable citizens by overt acts verging on rebellion, ought to be made to understand that such conduct can be no longer tolerated with impunity. The Bishop of Montreal urges the Patriot to stop before it is too late. Have you ever given serious thought to the horrors of civil war? Have you ever imagined the streams of blood flooding your streets and countryside, and the spectacle of the innocent caught up with the guilty in the same awful web of disaster? Have you considered that, almost without exception, every popular revolution is a bloodthirsty act? In Upper Canada, Mackenzie gives up all his expectations of Great Britain. London's rejection of the demands of the Patriot is the final blow. People of Upper Canada, Canadians, fellow colonists, behold the oppressors. In order to... Inspired by the example of Lower Canada, Mackenzie begins mobilizing his own supporters. If the British Kingdom can tax the people of Lower Canada against their will, they will do so with you when you dare to be free. For weeks, Mackenzie travels the countryside north of Toronto. His message strikes a chord among discontented citizens. They've been demanding schools, roads, and bridges for years to no avail. Who would not have it said of him that as an Upper Canadian, he died in the cause of freedom? To die fighting for freedom is truly glorious! Would you live and die a slave? Never! Mackenzie is tireless, organizing more than a dozen public meetings and speaking at them all. Three cheers for Mr. Papineau and his gallant countrymen! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! He wants to convince the government that the people want reform. And now I give you William Lyon Mackenzie! And that they support the Patriot in Lower Canada. People of Upper Canada! Bit by bit, Mackenzie edges closer to open rebellion. His supporters begin training with weapons. And the authorities are quick to sound the alarm. John McCauley, the Surveyor General, has little doubt where this will lead. In the rear of the town, the disaffected meet in squads with arms and are drilling, and I have no doubt they are in correspondence with the lower Canadian malcontents. The time may not be far distant when our muskets may again bear requisition, not in foreign, but civil war. The Papineau and Mackenzie faction seem almost infuriated, and I do not see how matters can end but in a resort to arms. But higher authorities believe the real threat is in Lower Canada, so the entire British garrison is sent there. By the late autumn of 1837, not one professional soldier remains in Toronto.
violence now breaks out across Lower Canada. In the county of Two Mountains in the Richelieu Valley and in the region south of Montreal, Patriot harass and intimidate local officials who refuse to join them. The spreading violence convinces the British military commander, General John Colburn, that now is the time to act. The revolutionists are running over a large section of the country, armed and menacing every individual who hesitates to join them. If we neglect to profit by the offers from the upper province and those by the inhabitants of Montreal to assist by raising cause, while we permit the declared revolutionists to arm quietly, we shall lose the province. In Montreal, the arrival of soldiers from the neighboring colonies heightens the tension. The Patriot leaders retreat to their strongholds. Saint-Benoît and Saint-Eustache in the county of Two Mountains, or Saint-Denis and Saint-Charles in the Richelieu Valley. Among them, Louis-Joseph Papineau. Arrest warrants for high treason are issued against them all. The civil authorities have called for the military to assist them in apprehending these persons. It is of the greatest importance to drag the leaders of the revolt from their meeting places. General Colburn orders troops into the Richelieu Valley. He wants to strike first before the insurgents can mount a serious military threat. A few miles outside Saint-Denis, the first contingent arrives at dawn. The troops have been marching all night. Daniel Lysons is a lieutenant in the 1st Regiment of Foot, the Royal Scots. It soon became evident that the rebels were on the alert. The church bells were heard in the distance ringing the alarm, and parties of skirmishers appeared on a left flank. November 23rd, 1837. The die is cast. At Saint-Denis, 300 British soldiers confront 800 Patriot. About a hundred of the rebels have taken up positions in front of the Saint-Germain house on the main road to Sorel. Papineau and the other leaders have entrusted the defense of Saint-Denis to Dr. Wolfred Nelson. I told my companions that their lives were sought after and that they must sell them as dearly as they could. To be steady, take good aim, lose no powder, and all attend to their duty, their self-preservation. The battle lasts for six hours. But musket fire is not highly accurate, and there are relatively few victims. Hey, 
Philippe Napoleon Pacot, a notary, is in the thick of the action. I don't know how many I killed, but I fired without remorse. It was not so much from a sentiment of insults and injustices, but the old instinct of traditional hatred of the races that awoke in us. We were fighting despotism, but it was above all the English that we loved to aim at. The stubborn resistance has taken the English by surprise, and their ammunition is running low. Finally, Colonel Charles Gore orders his men to retreat. Twelve soldiers and thirteen Patriot are dead. Louis-Joseph Papineau is not at Saint-Denis to celebrate the victory. Some will say that Wilfred Nelson ordered him to leave the village for his own safety. Others will accuse him of fleeing the battlefield. While his men celebrate, Nelson realizes they have taken a fateful step. We have now passed the Rubicon. Our very lives are at stake. There is no alternative. Even a mean, cringing submission will scarcely protect us from every kind of ignominy, insult, and injury, worse to bear than death itself. If indeed this event do not befall us at once, we see now but the painful necessity of taking up arms in good earnest and manfully awaiting the occurrences which our attitude may provoke. General Colburn is shaken by the Patriot victory and makes an urgent appeal to the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. The civil war has now commenced in this province. I entreat you, therefore, to call out the militia of Upper Canada and endeavour to send to Montreal as many corps as may be inclined to volunteer their services at this critical period. Political struggle has given way to armed rebellion. Saint-Denis is only the first in a series of bloody confrontations. The rebellion will spread all the way to Upper Canada. Hundreds of men will fall on the battlefields and the fate of Canada hangs in the balance. In the autumn of 1837, armed conflict erupts after years of political struggle. At Saint-Denis, the Patriot win an unexpected victory. Encouraged by this, Rebels in Upper Canada decide to march on Toronto. Would you live and die a slave? These men are desperate to win what they have dreamed of for years. Fire! The right to govern themselves. November 25th, 1837. The British Army is determined to crush the Patriot resistance. The fate of the rebellion will be decided at Saint-Charles in the Richelieu Valley. Fire! 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 
Jean-Philippe Boucher-Belleville is one of the 250 rebels. We were on the defensive. There was no doubt about it. And for us, the whole question came down to this. Were we to yield up our property, our women and children, to a horde of barbarians without so much as a struggle? To barbarians who had come not to obey the law, but to plunder us by fire and sword and fill their own pockets. Charles Beauclerk is one of the officers in command of 425 British soldiers at Saint-Charles. Colonel Weatherall hoped that a display of his force would induce some defection among the infatuated people. But unfortunately, for the sake of humanity, it was far otherwise. This gave rise to an order for the three center companies to fix bayonets and charge the works. Company! Experience! To the front! Spurt! by their comrades' fire, the Royal Scots, one of Britain's fiercest regiments, close ranks and advance on the barricade. After two straight hours of continuous gunfire from both sides, the troops charged with bayonets. We had no weapons suitable for close-range combat, and so we had to abandon the field to them. of the Patriots surrender. Lieutenant! Sir! Move your platoon forward and take care of the prisoners! But others refuse to admit defeat. The Battle of Saint-Charles ends in a bloodbath. 150 Patriot are killed and only seven British soldiers. News of the clash in the Richelieu Valley reaches Upper Canada. William Lyon Mackenzie is convinced the time is ripe to attack Toronto. In the absence of British troops, he hopes to seize power and form a provisional government. Most of Mackenzie's followers are disaffected farmers. He summons them to Montgomery's Tavern, a few miles north of Toronto. December 4th, only 150 men have answered Mackenzie's call. They are tired, famished, and poorly organized. Little Mac conducted himself like a crazy man all the time we're at Montgomery's. He went about storming and screaming like a lunatic, and many of us felt certain he was not in his right senses. Mackenzie's second-in-command is the surveyor and blacksmith, Samuel Lount. Now is the time that we have to go. There's no one waiting for us! Now's the time to go, I'm telling you! They argue late into the night, unable to agree on a plan of attack.
The next day, Mackenzie and Lout decide to act. 20 militiamen, loyal to the British Crown, are waiting for them along Young Street. Colonel Lout and those in the front fired. Fire! Instead of stepping to one side to make room for those behind to fire, fell flat on their faces. The next rank did the same thing. Many of the country people, when they saw the riflemen falling down and heard the firing, they imagined that those that fell were killed by the enemy's fire and took to their heels. Stop! We can take the city! Where are you going? Come back! Stand your ground, man! Stand your ground! The city would have been ours. In an hour. Probably without firing a shot. <laughs> but 800 ran. And unfortunately, the wrong way. Queen, lad. Two days later, a thousand militiamen and volunteers are issued arms and ammunition. They are ordered to oust the rebels from Montgomery's tavern. This time, it is Mackenzie's men who are waiting on Young Street. Half the rebels have firearms, the rest have only pikes and cudgels. is brief. The rebels drop their weapons and flee. Stand your ground! Stand your ground! Militiamen and volunteers ransack Montgomery's tavern and put it to the torch. Mackenzie, along with some of his comrades, makes his way to the United States. But others are not so lucky. Samuel Lump and Peter Matthews are hanged in front of the Toronto jail four months later. The rebellion in Upper Canada has lasted less than a week. In Lower Canada, armed rebels prepare for one last stand in the county of two mountains northwest of Montreal. On December 14, 1837, General John Colburn himself leads an expedition to the village of saint Eustache. Young Emily Berthelot watches his arrival. At 10 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday, a cold, clear, beautiful day, the English troops march down the King's Road, 1,500 strong. Infantry, artillery, cavalry, the officers in full dress regalia. The entire parade filed by at a leisurely pace with a kind of defiance.
for most of the Patriot, resistance against such a force seems impossible. They retreat. But one of the Patriot leaders, Dr. Jean-Olivier Chenier, is determined to fight back. He and a few dozen men occupy the village church. General Colburn orders his artillery to fire on the Patriot stronghold. The siege is underway. The parish priest, Jacques Paquin, witnesses the cannonade. All the cannons began firing together, battering the church with astonishing rapidity. The masonry was extremely solid and resisted a tremendous number of cannonballs as they were fired off one after the other. The church holds out against the cannon fire for two hours. General Colburn orders a detachment of the Royal Scots to dislodge the Patriot from their fortress at all costs. Among them, Lieutenant Lysons. We got round to the back of the church and found a small door leading into the sacristy, which we battered in. We then turned to our left and went into the main body of the church. Here, the rebels began firing down our heads. We could not get up to them for the staircases were broken down. So Ormsby lighted a fire behind the altar and got his men out. Father Paquin recounts the last moments of the battle. Dr. Chenier saw that he could no longer defend himself from inside the church, for it had completely succumbed to the flames. He gathered up several of his men and jumped out of the windows with them. He was trying to escape, but he could not get out of the cemetery and was soon struck by a bullet and collapsed. He died almost immediately. 70 Patriot and three soldiers are dead. In the days following, soldiers and volunteers take revenge, terrorizing the county of Two Mountains. Some of the rebels try to make it to the American border, but hundreds are taken prisoner. Dr. Wolfred Nelson and the journalist Jean-Philippe Boucher-Belleville are among them. Exiled in the United States, Louis-Joseph Papineau writes to his wife, Julie. My dear, cherished wife, in my flight, I escaped so many and such close dangers, felt such tormenting anguish at the sight of the misfortunes of my country, my family, my friends. I sometimes think, in spite of the immense disasters suffered, that Providence will one day shine on us liberating our unfortunate country and uniting our family once again. When your letter arrived, telling us that our future is as uncertain as the prison, I was utterly disheartened. Now that martial law has been reinstated and that the troops to be deployed throughout the countryside have arrived, I'm terribly afraid that we are to have our share of troubles, just as we had for a good part of the winter.
In the spring of 1838, rebels and patriot tried desperately to rekindle the flame of the rebellion. They have formed a secret society known as the Hunter's Lodge and are recruiting members on both sides of the American border. They are waiting for the right moment to launch a new offensive. Papineau and Mackenzie are not part of the movement. They have renounced armed action. Meanwhile, a new governor general arrives in Quebec, charged with a delicate mission. John George Lambton, first Earl of Durham, is an aristocrat, liberal, and reformer. His orders are to investigate the causes of the rebellion. I beg you to consider me as a friend and arbitrator, ready at all times to listen to your wishes, complaints, and grievances, and fully determined to act with the strictest impartiality. Lord Durham's first task is to decide the fate of the Patriot languishing in prison. On Queen Victoria's coronation day, 150 prisoners are freed. In exchange, eight leaders plead guilty and are exiled to Bermuda. Wilfred Nelson prepares to leave the land of his birth. We belong to our country, and we will willingly sacrifice ourselves on the altar of her liberties. We have revolted neither against the person of Her Majesty nor her government, but against a vicious colonial administration. Patriot leaders who have taken refuge in the United States are banished for life. In a letter to Queen Victoria, Lord Durham prides himself on having restored peace to the colony. Not one drop of blood has been shed. The guilty have received justice, the misguided mercy. But at the same time, security is afforded to the loyal and peaceable subjects of this hitherto distracted province. But Lord Durham's mission ends abruptly. Five months after arriving, he returns to England. The British government has accused him of exceeding his powers by sentencing the Patriot leaders to exile without trial. Little expected the reward I have received from home, disavowal and condemnation. In these circumstances, I have no business here. My authority is gone. All that rests is military power. That can be better wielded by a soldier. And Sir John Colborne will no doubt do it efficiently. Lord Durham sails for England, a second rebellion breaks out in Lower Canada. The Hunter's Lodge attacks the manor house of the Seigneury of Beauharnois. Inside are the Seigneur's son, Edward Ellis, and his wife, Jane. She sees her captors as French revolutionaries. My sister and I were left seated en chemise de nuit and robe de chambre in the midst of five or six of the most ruffian-looking men I ever saw, except in my dreams of Robespierre, and without a single being to give us either advice or assistance. But the Patriot victories are short-lived. The hunters soon head for the border.
The rekindled rebellion has been snuffed out in less than a week. In Upper Canada, the Hunter's Lodge carries out a series of raids along the American border. Fort Malden, Fighting Island, Thousand Islands, Short Hills, Prescott. But their determination is broken once and for all by a decisive defeat at Windsor. Julie Papineau has joined her husband in the United States. She writes to her son, Amédé. You say you do not understand why this country has not risen up en masse. After all, the people were told that they would be provided with arms and money, and that a great army would come from the States. They were told a thousand tales. The whole region south of Montreal pays a high price for the second uprising. A Montreal Herald journalist describes the reprisals. All the country back of La Prairie presented the frightful spectacle of a vast expanse of livid flame. It is sad to reflect on the terrible consequences of the revolt, of the irreparable ruin of so great a number of human beings, whether innocent or guilty. Nevertheless, the supremacy of the laws must be maintained inviolate, the integrity of the empire respected, and peace and prosperity assured to the English, even at the expense of the whole Canadian people. A thousand Glengarry Highlanders, militiamen from Upper Canada, burn and pillage everything in their path. Jane Ellis, no longer a captive, is witness to the devastation. The Glengarry's boast is no fear of our being forgotten, for we have left a trail six miles broad all through the country. They seem to be a wild set of men. One of them told me that the houses they had spared in coming down the country, they would surely burn in going back. Hundreds of rebels are convicted of high treason. In Upper Canada, 17 men are executed. In Lower Canada, 12 die on the gallows. An idealistic notary, Chevalier de Lorimier, is one of them. I have only a few hours left to live, but I wish to share this precious time between my religious duties and those I owe my compatriots. For them I die the inglorious death of the common murderer. For them I leave behind my young children and my wife who have no means of support. And for them I die crying, long live freedom. Long live independence. A Canadian a need a safe More than one hundred and forty prisoners from Upper and Lower Canada are deported. In the fall of 1839, they leave Quebec for a penal colony in Australia. Inspired by the exile's fate, a young man named Antoine Gérin Lajoie writes a song that will become famous. Si tu vois mon pays, mon pays malheureux. Si tu vois mon pays, mon pays malheureux. Va dire à mes amis que je me souviens.
1839 is a time of despair and bitterness for both Canadas. Bad harvests have left many farmers destitute. The failure of the rebellions seems to have dashed all the reformers' hopes. The final tally paints a bleak picture. More than 200 of their comrades dead on the battlefields or on the scaffold. Hundreds of others sentenced to exile. The opponents of reform have won a decisive victory. Then, in London, Lord Durham submits his report. It is not by weakening, but strengthening the influence of the people on its government that I believe that harmony is to be restored where dissension has so long prevailed, and a regularity and vigor, hitherto unknown, introduced into the administration of these provinces. To everyone's astonishment, Durham accepts one of the reformers' central demands. He recommends that the governor's advisors, the men who actually run the government, should have the support of the elected assembly. In Lower Canada, he sees another, possibly more serious, problem. I expected to find a contest between a government and a people. I found two nations warring in the bosom of a single state. I found a struggle not of principles, but of races. And I perceived that it would be idle to attempt any amelioration of laws or institutions until we could first succeed in terminating the deadly animosity that now separates the inhabitants of Law Canada into the hostile divisions of French and English. Durham proposes uniting the two Canadas so French-speaking members of Parliament will be in the minority. Assimilation, he believes, would benefit the French Canadians, a people he sees as having no history and no literature. The language, the laws, the character of the North American continent are English, and every race but English appears there in a condition of inferiority. It is to elevate them from that inferiority that I desire to give the Canadians our English character. London welcomes the idea of union, seeing it as a way of settling the French problem once and for all. But there will be no movement towards self-government. The reformers in British North America are bitterly disappointed. In Nova Scotia, Joseph Howe refuses to be daunted by London's decision. But for the moment, he has a more immediate problem to deal with. The Halifax elite are trying once again to silence him. This time, he won't be defending himself in court, but with a pistol in a duel. During the political struggles in which I have been engaged, several attempts have been made to make me pay the penalty of life for the steady maintenance of my opinions. Hitherto, Providence has spared my life. This may not always be the case. I feel that I am bound to hazard my life rather than blight all prospects of being useful. If I fall, cherish the principles I have taught. Forgive my errors protect my children. Howe has brashly declared that the children of the rich are no better than the apprentices in his printing shop. His words have outraged Halifax society. As the offended party, Howe's adversary, John Halliburton, takes the first shot.
All is well that ends well. I never intended to fire at him and would not for 10,000 pounds. All that was necessary was for me to let them see that the reformers could teach them a lesson of coolness and moderation. Thousands of miles from Halifax, two other reformers are preparing for a new political battle. Robert Baldwin is a lawyer, the son of one of Toronto's richest families. Late that autumn, Baldwin is trying to pick up the pieces of the great reform project. He sends a letter that will change the course of history. Baldwin proposes an alliance with the Lower Canadian Patriot. Together, they will command a reform majority in the new House of Assembly. There is, and must be, no question of races. It were madness on one side and guilt, deep guilt on both to make such a question. The reformers of Upper Canada are ready to make every allowance for the unfortunate state of things and are resolved, as I believe them to be, to unite with their lower Canadian brethren cordially as friends and to afford every assistance in obtaining justice. In Lower Canada, most of the Patriot leaders are in exile. Baldwin sends his message to one of the few men in a position to carry on the struggle, Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine. It is in the interest of the reformers of both provinces to come together in the legislature in a spirit of peace, union, friendship, and fraternity. United action is needed now more than ever. La Fontaine has risen from modest origins to become a prosperous lawyer and an influential politician. He sees the union of the Canadas as a despotic act. He believes it is designed to make French Canadians a permanent minority in the new assembly. But Baldwin's letter gives him hope. I have no doubt that the advocates of reform in Upper Canada feel the need, as we do, to join forces, and that in the first sitting of the legislature, they will show us some unequivocal evidence of this, which I hope will be the sign of a lasting and mutual bond of trust. In 1841, the Act of Union comes into force. One colony, one governor, one assembly, one language, English. Kingston is chosen as the capital. The Reform Alliance undergoes a baptism of fire in the first election since the defeat of the rebellions. Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine is running for election in Terrebonne, a county he represented before the rebellions but the only polling office has been placed at the entrance of a village that is mostly English. When Lafontaine and his supporters show up to vote, a mob is waiting. into a painful decision. And so, I inform the returning officer that in order to avoid bloodshed and the massacre of great numbers, I was withdrawing from the contest. Without La Fontaine in the House of Assembly, the Reform Alliance is in danger. Robert Baldwin turns to his father, who is running for office in a Toronto riding. I think it would be very desirable that you should, 
though you may have already accepted the nomination for North York, suggest to them the expediency of accepting your retirement and of returning Mr. Lafontaine, if he will accept the nomination instead of you. I'm satisfied that nothing that could be done at this conjuncture would have a better effect upon the state of parties in the House than his return just now for North York. Lafontaine accepts the offer and wins the election. A French-Canadian patriot elected in an English riding. A year later, they win another victory when Baldwin is elected in Rimouski in the Lower St. Lawrence. These gestures of goodwill strengthen the alliance between reformers from both Canadas and the personal friendship of both men. Together, Baldwin and Lafontaine lead the battle for a government run by the people's elected representatives. And in the years to come, La Fontaine can rely on Baldwin's support to restore the French language in Parliament. In the mid-19th century, Britain is rewriting the rules of empire. Her leaders decide to scrap the system that until now has favored products from British colonies. Manufacturers can now buy raw materials wherever they are cheapest. It's a change that hits the colonies hard. But with looser economic ties, the empire can also relax its political control. At last, the reformers of British North America are granted what they have been demanding for decades, the power of self-government. The moment Joseph Howe has been awaiting for so long has finally arrived. In 1847, his party wins the Nova Scotia election and a few months later takes power the first responsible government in the colonies of the British Empire. It will be our pride to make Nova Scotia a normal school for the rest of the colonies, showing them how representative institutions may be worked to ensure internal tranquility and advancement in subordination to the paramount interest and authority of the Empire. At the same time, the province of Canada is in the midst of an election. The reformers, led by Baldwin and Lafontaine, are victorious here as well. The goal of the union of the two provinces was the destruction of the French Canadians. Since then, things have changed. The author of this measure was mistaken. He wanted to lay low a whole category of citizens. But today, the facts show that everyone is on equal footing. The province has passed through a long and arduous struggle for the establishment of a system of government founded on the broad basis of British constitutional principles. Your favor and the confidence of a large portion of the people of my country placed me in a position in which I was called upon to perform no unimportant part in the great battle of the Constitution. The battle has been fought. The victory has been achieved. But the rejoicing is short-lived. In Parliament, now located in Montreal, the Baldwin-Lafontaine government introduces a controversial bill. 
Lafontaine proposes compensation for Lower Canadians, whose property was destroyed during the rebellions and in the reprisals that followed. All those who can prove their losses and have not been convicted of sedition will be compensated. It will put self-government to its first crucial test. The Rebellion Losses Bill puts the new Governor General, Lord Elgin, in a difficult position. If he rejects the bill, he will undermine the very foundation of responsible government. If he approves it, he will incur the wrath of many English citizens of Lower Canada who see the bill as a measure to reward traitors. A good deal of excitement and bad feeling has been stirred. The opposition leaders, who are very low in the world at the moment, have taken advantage of the circumstance to work upon the feelings of the old loyalists as opposed to rebels, of British as opposed to French, and of Upper Canada as opposed to Lower. And thus, to provoke from various parts of the province the expression of not very temperate or measured discontent. Lord Elgin finally decides to accept the bill. As he leaves Parliament, an angry mob awaits him. Many of the English in Montreal feel betrayed by the governor and by England. The disgrace of Great Britain accomplished. Canada sold and given away. The end has begun. Anglo-Saxons, you must live for the future. Your blood and your race will now be supreme. A mass meeting will be held on the Place d'Arme this evening at 8 o'clock. To the struggle. Now is your time. crowd marches in fury on Parliament. The rioters break down the doors and set fire to the building, which rapidly succumbs to the flames. of rage in Montreal distresses Joseph Howe. We hear a great deal about anglifying the French Canadians. And a union of the provinces is sometimes advocated with a view to swamping and controlling that portion of the population, which being of French origin still preserve their ancient religion, manners and language. But if the process of anglifying is to include any species of injustice to that large body of British subjects, who already form at least one half of the population of United Canada, to such a design, no matter in what form pressed or by whom entertained, we will be no parties. The burning of Parliament is a last desperate act by the opponents of reform. These men, with their privileged connections to England, are now terribly weakened. By signing the Rebellion Losses Bill, Lord Elgin has confirmed that the colonists can make their own decisions from now on. And by bridging the divide between English and French, Baldwin and La Fontaine have ushered in an era of democratic reform.
A decade after the burning of Parliament, peace and prosperity have returned to Canada. The beginning of this new age is witnessed by a new eye, that of the photographer. Two and a half million people now live in the colonies of British North America. Harvests are good. Sawmills are selling their wood to the United States. The bustling colonial ports send their ships around the world. New canals link the St. Lawrence to the Great Lakes. In 1851, Robert Baldwin retires from public life. He is only 47 years old, but the parliamentary battles he has led for a decade have exhausted him. He dies eight years later. Louis-Paulette Lafontaine leaves politics only a few months after his friend Baldwin. He is also tired and ill. He dies at the age of 56. After his return from exile, William Lyon Mackenzie is elected to the Parliament of the Province of Canada, but he is largely ignored. A bitter man, Mackenzie retires from politics in 1859 and dies two years later at 66. Now back in Canada, Louis-Joseph Papineau also makes a brief return to politics. But like Mackenzie, he has lost his audience. He retires with his wife Julie to his estate. Papineau dies in 1871, a few days before his 85th birthday. Joseph Howe is the only one of these leaders to carry on with his political career. He becomes the champion of the railway, symbol of the Industrial Revolution and the building of a new nation. A country that will soon expand far westward, across the prairies and over the Rockies to the shores of the Pacific. Canada. A Canadien a nid de ses foyers. A Canadien a Vani de ses foyers, parcourait en pleurant des pays étrangers, parcourait en pleurant des pays étrangers. Un jour triste et pensif, assis au bord des flots. Un jour triste et pensif, assis au bord des flots. Au courant fugitif, il adressa ses mots. Si tu vois mon pays, mon pays malheureux, si tu vois mon pays, mon pays Je me souviens. 